Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast, live at MixCon. To prove that this is live at MixCon, I'm gonna need some help from our audience. Can you guys give us a round of applause to show we're live here at MixCon? All right, this is an annual event we've been putting on. It really is the world's only convention that's all about mixing, mixing audio, particularly mixing music, but we also delve into sound for pictures, sound for games. And today's podcast episode, we're going to have three panelists on. And they're all going to be talking about a topic that we've all got to stay up on, whether we are professionals in the field or aspiring professionals, and that is the future of music production. What is coming up next? How are the ways that we're working going to change this year, next year, and how are things going to look different five and ten years out? We have three panelists who have some tremendous insights onto that. Before I introduce each of them, I just want to give a big thanks to our sponsors for this podcast. The reason we can bring you MixCon absolutely for free is because of our sponsors. And first big shout out to Isotope for sponsoring this podcast, a very future-focused audio company. Can you guys give a big round of applause to Isotope, please? Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to bring up our sponsors in just, uh, I'm going to bring up our presenters in just a second. Uh, the other two sponsors I want to thank, regular podcast sponsors, are Sound Toys, making some of my favorite plugins out there for creative mixing, and Eventide, uh, really awesome software and hardware audio brand. So big thank you to those guys. This is why we're able to bring you MixCon and all this stuff absolutely for free. Now, with your 90 seconds or so of pure bliss, where I shout out our sponsors, over, let's bring up our panelists. The first guy is Mr. John Bailey. John, if you would come up to the stage, please. John Bailey is with one of the sponsors on this. We didn't bring him on just because they're a sponsor. We brought John on because John is someone I've known for years. He helped me at SAE. He was on the board when I was the audio chair of SAE, helping us kind of look over that program. And he is a guy with his finger on the pulse of where audio has been and where it's going. This is the chief technical officer. Is that right? Is that your title? That's right. Chief, chief, chief technology officer. Ch chief technology officer. It's very different, actually. Very different. <laughs> yeah, not technical. So thank you so much, Chief Technology Officer of Isotope, John Bailey, being here. We're going to be talking with him about artificial intelligence and machine learning in music. Are robot mixers and mastering engineers going to turk our gerbs? The answer, possibly yes, possibly no. We'll find out, and we'll, we'll see how the tools that we're going to be using are going to change. So a big round of applause to Mr. John Bailey, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, I hope I'm saying this correctly, Marta God Spaderic. Marta God Spaderic is, well, why don't you come on up, Marta? I'll tell them about you as you come up. Give a big round of applause to Marta. Marta is a specialist in spatial audio, 3D sound, immersive audio, audio technology where you really feel like you're in the space. This could be binaural headphones. This could be surround systems. And we're going to talk about how speaker and headphone playback systems are changing dramatically both in the studio and for consumers. So Marta's going to be on to talk to us about that. Thank you so much, Marta, for being here. <laughs> Last but not least, multi-time Grammy-nominated mastering engineer, Alan Silverman. Alan, if you step up for just a moment. Alan is going to be speaking to us about the future of loudness and the future of the loudness wars in audio. Things have been changing a lot in loudness, particularly with streaming services that have auto volume normalization. And Alan is also going to be playing us and showing us some material. For those of you listening to the podcast version, I'd recommend you check out the video version of this podcast as well for some of his slides, but we'll also play you audio examples. Alan is going to step off stage for a few minutes because he's going to be playing us some audio, showing us some slides, and he's going to get that stuff set. So thank you, Alan. We'll see you again in about 15 minutes. Thank you. See you. All right. With all that intro out of the way, it's time to dive right into today's topic. And once we get through some basics with John, with Alan, with Marta, I want to open up to questions from you. And maybe that we can ask questions of each other because we're really going to be focusing on what is changing in music production and what is going to be looking different going forward. So you guys have probably heard of artificial intelligence, right? All right. You guys have probably maybe heard of machine learning as the tactic we use to develop artificial intelligence. 
And I think a lot of you are encountering artificial intelligence in places that you might not even be aware of. And you're going to encounter it more and more in music and music production tools coming up. So real quick, John, where is artificial intelligence today? Where are people already experiencing it that they might not be aware of? I, I mean, we're surrounded by it nowadays. The, the most common place, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to create an analogy to the kinds of tools and products that we're creating, the place I typically start is your smartphone. I'm, I'm going to guess just about everybody in this room is using a smartphone of some kind. You're not on your old StarTac or something like that. Your, your photo album, if you're on an iPhone, certainly, you may have noticed that you can go into your albums and your iPhone can automatically detect which of the photographs you've taken have a face in them. So that's using machine learning technology to do that or AI technology to do that. That, that, that same feature can also categorize those photos by person, right? It can actually build albums out of specific people that you commonly take photographs of. That's a machine learning algorithm as well. On every social network, at the Google News feed, we're, we're sort of surrounded by this technology in our lives nowadays. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty omnipresent. And before we talk about the specifics of you know, how you've been trying to integrate and some of the tools you're developing, what do you think are some of the most inspiring things that you've seen in the audio world as far as AI in audio? Where have you been seeing it that's kind of state of the art and impressive to you? In the audio world specifically, it's, it's kind of early days for us, honestly. I'd say we're, we're lagging behind other industries in terms of embracing these technologies. However, you know, there are certainly some other companies and some other research organizations that are doing interesting work. One group that we take a lot of inspiration from at Isotope isn't actually a company, but it's a team that's at Google as part of their brain organization called the Magenta team, which if you haven't heard of this team, their, their stated purpose, which is actually pretty different than Isotope's, is they're looking for ways to sort of automate creativity or art creation. And, and the reason they're doing that is they're really trying to push the boundaries of how you can use these technologies in a creative context. They've come out with some pretty interesting tools. One of them they released, I think maybe two or three years ago, as a, as a neural synthesizer. It's called nSynth, which can essentially can kind of abstract out or extrapolate the acoustical traits of different types of instruments and allow you to be able to morph between those different kinds of sounds. From a, from a sonic standpoint or kind of a creative standpoint, I, I'm not sure a lot of people are using it in contemporary music production, but in terms of trying to push the state of the art, they're doing some really, really interesting work there. You know, there are other companies, a, a, a competitor of Isotope's Lander, you know, they have an online automated mastering platform. I don't, I don't know how the technology works, but, but they, um, they claim, and I, I, I'm sure it's genuine, that it's powered by machine learning. Uh, Audionamics is another company that's invested a lot in that area uh, to, in unmixing applications, or it, technically we call that source separation, which is taking a mixture of two or more sounds and being able to separate them into their constituent components. Right. Interesting. Now, now, you guys, I think, are also kind of at the forefront of this stuff because when you unveiled, I think it was Neutron a few years ago. Is this two or three years ago now, Neutron? Yeah, the first version was three years ago. Yeah. And I saw this thing. It was one of those moments where I was like, oh, of course, this is what's going to happen next. Can you explain to us what Isotope's Neutron does and how AI and machine learning is built into that? Yeah. First of all, it's a mixing tool for you guys not familiar with. It's like a mixing suite, does EQ, compression, helps you set levels. And what's under the hood there? Yeah, yeah. If you're not familiar with the product, it's Isotope's channel strip product, for a lack of a better description. So as Justin said, EQ, dynamics processing, et cetera, et cetera. There's a few other features. Multiband compression, dynamic EQ, some yep. already yep. stuff that's not in everything. Yep, yeah. yeah. So... Um, so Neutron, we had been investing in machine learning research for a number of years prior to releasing Neutron, but it was more, um, we hadn't really elevated our, the, the, either the technology or the story behind it to kind of what I would call like a box feature, like the kind of thing that our marketing team would really embrace and want to sort of push uh, as part of the release. At, at the time we released Neutron, we... we um, started to see some success with a technique that in the, in the AI world we call classification. And if you've ever seen the TV show Silicon Valley, you, you know what I'm talking about. That's the like hot dog or not hot dog example in that TV show. If you don't get that reference, I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> but what, what a classifier does is it takes a piece of uh, content. Um, the example I gave actually from your, from your iPhone is, is um, it also uses this foundational technology where it can identify 
a, a label, basically. Um, it can figure out what the, what, what's, what's within that content. You can imagine that in any media content, images, audio, videos, it's a really difficult problem to solve in a kind of generic way. So we, we had been investing in the use of classifiers to see if we could identify what the underlying content was from a stream of audio. So we don't get any metadata, right? We don't know, you know, if you put, if you put a plug in on a track in your DAW, we, we don't know what the content of that, that audio stream that's going to go through the plugin is. So we invested in building an instrument classifier, which is to, to d determine, okay, what's the instrument that's underlying this track of it's audio? It's almost like facial recognition for audio. For this is a guitar. This is a synth. This is a pad. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it does. So, so Neutron, as we stream audio through it, is making a determination. It's, it, it's using something called a neural network, which is a standard uh, kind of tool or model uh, that we use within machine learning to determine, is this content, is it likely to be a guitar or a voice or drums or a piano or uh, et cetera, et cetera. I and got it. But what good is that doing me besides you've labeled it? Uh, we know this is a guitar, this is a snare drum. How does that help me in my actual work? Yeah, so that's kind of half the problem, right? So once we know what the instrument is, then we can make a recommendation based on, I'll say, mixing pedagogy. You know, what, what, so we know this is a guitar, and we can also extract some other acoustic features from it. So we might know that it's maybe a, a more likely to be an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar, et cetera, et cetera. And then based on the canon of mixing, which we're going to talk about for the next two days here, we can make a recommendation for a, a kind of good starting point for that sound, right? You know, if you're dealing with a voice, you're probably not going to, you know, emphasize the low end. <laughs> you know, um, you might want to roll, roll that off, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You might want to apply a little light compression. Maybe we we need a little DSing, right? So the, the intent of that, the goal of that feature was to give you as the mixing engineer just a good kind of clean starting point so that you can focus on getting creative with your work and not have to go kind of clean up stuff right out of the gate. Right. And uh, I think there's also more than it does than just giving you feedback when, say, this is playing, it's a guitar, here are some guitar presets we can recommend for you. There's also this kind of masking feature, if I remember correctly, and that was the thing that really interested me about Neutron, is that you could compare one track to another. So I have a pad happening and a guitar happening, and it'll tell me, hey, if you want this guitar to poke out relative to this specific pad, here's what you can do. Is there an AI component involved in those kind of recommendations, or is that... So, so that actually, so this, I'm glad you asked, that does not use machine learning. That's based on a psychoacoustic model that we've built. Interesting. And our, our next panelist, Marta, is going to probably explain what that means much more frequently <laughs> than I could. Yeah. Uh, but, but, um, but no, that's not machine learning technology under the hood. Now, now we've since, we just uh, recently, just last month, check it out, uh, released our uh, most updated version of Neutron. We're now on the third version of the product. And now what we're starting to do is combine these technologies together. And that's where I think we're starting to really unlock the power of the potential of machine learning, not just machine learning, but machine learning and what, what I call sort of traditional signal processing. I don't have a better way to describe it, but it's um, you know, filtering, EQing, spectral processing, all of the techniques that we've been using in, in this world, in the world of music technology for years. Machine learning is this new tool in our toolbox that is very powerful and allows us to solve complicated problems that we couldn't solve before. But where we're seeing the real power of that is where we can combine that with other features. We're starting now to combine the analysis of uh, instruments, not just within a single track. So on Neutron 1, this would just look at a single stream of audio and make a recommendation based on that. We just launched the new feature in the latest version of Neutron, which we call the Mix Assistant. So our plugins can talk to each other across tracks. We call that inner plugin communication. And so now, if I've, you can imagine, if I know that you've got a group of, of uh, drums and a couple guitars and bass and vocals, we can start to aggregate that together and, and instead of just making a recommendation for a starting point on an individual track basis, we can start to look at the mix as a whole. And that's a place where when you factor in the, the masking technology, we've progressed that from detecting masking and, and visualizing that for the user to actually recommending EQ settings for unmasking. When you take the combination of knowing what your instruments are across your tracks, as Alan will talk about later, some notion or semblance of loudness and what's sort of the preference or priority of, tr of tracks 
maybe should be in your mix, and then, and then an understanding of what signals might be masking each other, we can start to kind of push, push a little bit into the realm of not just assistive processing of an individual track, but assistive mixing across the entire mix. Interesting. Now, there's a few other places where I know you guys are integrating uh, AI into your technology. Before we do, I want to get your philosophy, with personally and you know, as someone trying to develop software for others, with something like Magenta, with something like Lander, there's this fear that people have to a degree of, hey, these, you're going to create mastering robots that are going to put all mastering engineers out of business. I'm personally not that afraid of it, and I have done at least one episode of the podcast about why I'm not afraid of services like Lander taking my job. That said, I could imagine it being a big obstacle for someone starting mastering, and I could see why some people could be concerned about these automated processes. Maybe something like Magenta creating cues that people could use for you know, TV spots where they don't have to pay a license fee now to a musician, they're getting a cue. There's a lot of replacement going on. And how do you feel about that whole paradigm? Should people be concerned about these things replacing them? Should they be glad that they're going to be coming and helping them do their jobs better? What's your thought about how that's going to happen and what's your approach to, to kind of handling this uh, question? Yeah, I, it's a good question. And I think it would be easy for me to say, oh, no, it's all good, it's all fine, nothing will change, your life will be better. But I don't think that would be an honest answer. We're in a moment of technological advancement that, that I think is going to force, it's going to necessitate across a whole range of industries thinking differently about how we work and what it is that we work on. I drew a distinction from the Magenta team a minute ago. I, I have tremendous respect for those folks, but at Isotope, we're a bunch of musicians at Isotope. You know, we're, we're, our, our stated purpose, our, our reason to exist as a company is to enable and inspire people to be creative, not to sort of automate them out and kind of disrupt an industry by replacing human beings with technology. So what we're really interested in doing is finding opportunities where we can take, if you look at kind of the history of music technology, we, we're, we're going through a transition from, from needing to have a highly technical skill set and specialization to allowing people to be more and more creative or focused on more and more creative problems. So if you wanted to make a, a musical recording 50, 60 years ago, you literally had to be an engineer. You had to have engineering chops. You needed to know how to solder. You needed to know, understand electronic signal flow. If you didn't know, how, if you didn't know all that stuff, you couldn't do it. And so, you know, with, with the advent of of an industry that provided tools for you, and then Pro Tools, and you know the advent of desktop computing, et cetera, et cetera. You can see this kind of curve over time that's allowed to sort of democratize the process of creating music and allowed more and more people to tap into that and gain access to that. So that that's we, we see ourselves on that continuum and part of a movement that's allowed more people to make music. Has that had an impact on people's jobs? Most definitely, absolutely. You know, 40 years ago, if you didn't own a recording studio, you couldn't, you couldn't make music, right? And, and Pro Tools changed that, and we're certainly part of that movement. But, but for us, um, you know, we're really trying to kind of thread the needle. So for example, Lander makes more automated tools, we make more assistive tools. That may seem like a subtle distinction, but at the end of the day, what's important for us is, is leaving the creative control in the customer's hands and allowing you guys to do whatever it is you want to do ultimately. All right. All right. I want to editorialize on this for just a moment and just sure. give my yeah. thoughts on this real quick because I, I can't shut my mouth sometimes. I would say that I'm not that afraid of this because with Pro Tools, there is this narrative that, oh, it's destroyed studios, it's destroying studio jobs, now everyone can make records in their bedroom. But what I see instead is there are people making records in their bedrooms who in the past wouldn't have made records. And then they get really interested in the process, and then they seek out professional help. And to me, you know, yelling at people who are using Lander and paying a few bucks to master their track instead of going to a mastering engineer, I'm seeing people who are getting interested in audio quality, and they're at the beginning of the funnel, who will eventually, if they want to progress in their careers, want to enlist professional help, want to enlist cur curatorial help. Because ultimately, there, you could use any one of 10 different algorithms. Well, which one's best? That's a human creative decision. And what the computers are really good at is taking a rule set that we've established and following that rule set. What human beings are really good at is breaking the rules and setting up new sets of rules when the old ones get boring. So I think that's one reason I'm not afraid. Another one, the economic reality of Pro Tools, is that from the year 2000 to the year 2010, 
you actually saw an increase of audio jobs by about, I think it was 50%. I have an article about this, and you'll see that actual audio salaries went up and the number of audio jobs went up. At the same time, something that happened is a lot of big studios closed down. So instead of having 20, 30 huge studios in LA, now there's like five. But there's like two or 300 new garage studios opening up, and people are doing professional work out of it. So this has been happening forever. In the 1920s, the tractor came out, People lost farm jobs, and now we get to have audio jobs instead of, you know, get out there with a hoe. So that's nice. So that's my optimism. Maybe I'm too much of a Pollyanna, but that's, that's where I'm looking. I mean, one, one thing, you know, being a CTO at a company like Isotope, we make these products, we design them, you know, with a very specific type of customer in mind, with very specific use cases in mind, and then we put them out into the world. And you guys find ways of using these products that we never would have dreamed of as well. And so, you know, what I find is that as we sort of push the bar in terms of technology and what we're capable of doing, that just results in a kind of attendant shift and creative output. When I, I joined Isotope eight years ago, and the first product I worked on, some of you folks might be familiar with it, was a, a product called Iris. It's a spectral synthesizer, kind of sampling synthesizer product. That came from, actually, that came out of a podcast, the oh, idea really? for that. Yeah. We, we were listening to this podcast, and a couple friends of the company, the G4 software guys, said that they were using RX, which is our repair and edit tool for sound design applications. That product was not designed as a sound design application at all. And they said, you guys should make a synthesizer out of this. And we heard that and we're like, wow, that's a really good idea. Maybe we should play around with that. Maybe we should make a synthesizer out of that. So, you know, for me, I am just continually sort of inspired and kind of awestruck by when we put a tool out into the world, what our users, our customers can create with it and how they will push us to raise the bar, basically, and allow more creativity. That's amazing, because that's a new category of synthesis. I mean, there was subtractive synthesis, and then was additive, and then, oh, granular synthesis, that's new. We have technology, and now spectral synthesis. This is stuff that people wouldn't have even, it wouldn't have occurred to them 20 years ago, not to mention 15 or 10. Right, right. And I mean, you, 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 you just made a very uh, important point that I sort of want to double down on, which is, you, you said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not going to get it exactly, but more or less what you said was, you know, the technology is good at sort of encapsulating the rules. And what musicians do or creative people do is break the rules. Yeah. And that, I mean, no, nowhere is that more true than machine learning applications. What, what is the types of technology that I'm talking about, what it's trying to do, it's a, essentially a statistical model that's trying to, in the case of the instrument classifier, it's trying to put things in a bucket, right? But what if you create a new bucket? The, the, the algorithm doesn't know what to do with that. Yeah. You can't do anything with that. Especially in music, I think this is true, where we're creating models that represent sort of the current creative paradigms of today. Yeah. But those are changing constantly, right? And so the technology, in a way, is always going to be lagging behind where, where the creative output is. Yeah. That's very interesting. And uh, one last thing I want to say on that idea of breaking the rules is that uh, one thing that AI has been very good at is beating human beings at chess beating human beings at Go, which is an even more complicated game. And what machines aren't as good at is saying, these games are boring now because machines can beat us. No human can rise to the top. Let's come up with a new game. What will be fun? Let's do jujitsu. Let's do CrossFit. Let's do crazy kickball. You know, whatever it is. Those are the kinds of weird things that human beings do and come up with uh, solutions. Now, I want to talk to you more about your mastering tools, uh, Isotope and Ozone. But before we do, I want to go a little further into this conversation, mix it up with Mr. Alan Silverman. If we can welcome Alan up back to the stage. We'd love to get Alan uh, up here. Alan has got a slightly more, instead of this being a little more interview focused, I talked to Alan beforehand, and he said, I really need to play these people some audio clips. And for those of you who are watching the video version or here in person, you can see some slides as well. And he's going to be talking to us about loudness. So I just want to set this up by saying loudness and the loudness wars are a place where audio and music production are changing and changing dramatically. When the CD changer was a big thing, it was, hey man, we have to make sure our CD is louder than the next CD. And a whole entire skill set of smashing things, making them as loud as possible, just so they could get loud with another things, ended up coloring the sound, right? And the sounds that people got from loudness ended up being part of the aesthetic of certain genres. And if things weren't smashed with limiters or compressed heavily, it kind of sounded wrong. And then there were other genres that didn't respond well to this kind of loudness. But a big, big change that's been happening is how many of you guys have a CD with a CD changer right now by show of hands? Zero hands went up, right? 
So where are you listening? A lot of people now are listening on Spotify, on YouTube, on Pandora. And what do these services have in common? They automatically normalize volume. And they do it in a very simple and ingenious way. I think this is the best possible of all bad ways. They take the loudest stuff and turn it down. So what does that mean for us going forward when we're going into a new audio environment where most people are going to have tracks normalized for them? Is that going to change the way records sound? Is that going to change how we approach getting loudness? If you really smash your stuff and then expect it to be super loud and hear it on Spotify, it might get turned down and that's not louder than everything else. And then were the things you were doing to get loudness good for the tone? I don't know. That's an aesthetic question. But I think Alan can give us some great guidance on navigating loudness in general and how things are changing. So, Alan, please, take it away. Sure. Thank you, Justin. So, Justin laid out the, the problem, which is how do we get our records to, to play loud? And how is that different today than it was last year or 10 years ago? Now, I love to cue up a great record and play it loud. Anyone feel the same way here? Anyone out there? Come on, of course you do. That's why we get into this crazy business in the first place, the art form of, of making uh, records. We want to feel and hear all the details, feel the beat. We want to be carried away by that soaring lead vocal. So loudness has always been a source of great pleasure in music, and uh, you know, let's face it, louder is better. That's how the human ear works, and that is not going to, to change. So loudness has always been a driving goal in record making, and we want our work to jump out of the speakers. But what does that mean in practical terms? Well, loudness seems like a simple concept, just turn it up to 11, we're done, right? But as mixers, you know that it's a lot more complicated than that. Give you an example of how loudness has always driven this business. You probably all have heard of Bob Ludwig, the famous awesome mastering engineer. So he was on a studio staff in the 1960s and cutting records, and he found out that Neumann made a new lathe that could cut a record 60 be hotter than any other. He went to his boss and said, hey, Art, we gotta get this new lathe. Art said, how much is it? Bob said, like $100,000. Art said, eh, forget it. Bob got some investors, set up a room, bought the lathe, was cutting records 60 be hotter than anyone in New York. Within a month, all of the business was going to Bob, all of it. And that's how uh, his mastering business got started. So we want our records to play loud and proud on whatever uh, medium we're working with. And as Justin pointed out, as technology changes, techniques change. And in fact, the change today is absolutely huge. The way audio is treated today is radically different from the way it has ever been treated in the past in terms of broadcast, records, media, it's a completely Alice in Wonderland world that's turned around on its head. And it's really important as producers and mixers to really understand that. The other aspect about loudness is it sounds like a simple idea, but it's actually a very complex idea. And it's made more complicated by the fact that loudness is a bit like news in that there is true loudness and fake loudness. <laughs> and I'll try to play some examples and give you some specific techniques and ideas about how to navigate that. So first, I'm going to very briefly bring us up to the present day. So engineers have always striven to get a signal onto the medium that is louder than the noise of the medium. So level was very key there, whether it be the Ellis Edison cylinder or 1930s radio with lots of static or a 45 RPM with lots of surface noise, 1950, cruising down in your you know, great ride with the top down and a great dashboard radio all the, the road noise. So we've always striven as engineers to have a signal that rises above that noise, but yet still sounds like music, and that's the trick. And of course, the infamous cassette. We were fighting against noise on the cassette. But this cassette was a huge change in itself. It was the beginning of music on the go, the Walkman, uh, people carrying around their tunes in their playlists with them. The first huge, huge change was the compact disc. 1982, believe it or not, before many of you were born. This was the very first time in the history of audio that the dynamic range of the medium was actually larger than the dynamic range of music. So before we had to compress and condense the music down from its natural lows and highs, or loud and soft, to fit into the medium. With the compact disc, that wasn't necessary. But there was a very steep learning curve with the compact disc. It wasn't just a matter of 
roll out the lathe and roll in the compact disc recorder. Engineers had to learn a whole new technology. For example, we no longer needed the EQ that we used to need on vinyl to compensate for things. So it took a while to learn that. The early CDs tended to be bright because engineers thought they were cutting a lacquer when they weren't. So there was a huge requirement to learn new techniques with the compact disc, and that lesson was learned. And things have gotten a lot better since then. Finally, to the point of iTunes, which is another huge change, where files began to replace discs. And lately, the hugest change is the total takeover of streaming. And when I say total takeover, Universal Music Group just announced that they are making $10 million a day on streaming. So streaming is, is really here to stay. It's our new world. And what streaming amounts to in terms of audio, and I'll explain this later, is that we're going to be transitioning from a world of peak normalized sound to loudness normalized sound and what that means. Because that is a huge, huge shift that requires us all to understand what loudness really is and how it really works. So up until this time, the primary tool for loudness was just cracking up the level. And the main means for cracking up the level was, were compressors, such as the famous Fairchild or the LA-2. And then lately we have incredible plugins such as the Isotope Neutron. So all of these plugins or devices, they have one job basically to reduce dynamic range and raise level. Okay. So let's take a look at where we are today. So Pro Audio began in 1924. That was when General Electric came out with the first commercial loudspeaker. In 1924, we were getting 60 dB of dynamic range. Right, we can see that. But 0.3% distortion. Cut to 1996, humans invent their digital brick wall limiter, the beginnings of the infamous loudness wars. And now, today, we have distortion super high, 20% or more, and we're using a dynamic range of 12 dB on most of our pop records. So we've got 60 times more distortion and one-fifth the dynamic range because of our quest for loudness. So that's got to tell you that something is not sustainable here. Something is not being thought about correctly. This is where we're at. So a bunch of engineers decided we've got to do something about this. I mean, what's the point of having great recordings if everything is like smashed and compressed into 6 dB of 12 dB of dynamic range, and it's like blaring at you? What's the point of, of what are we doing here? So they began to study what was missing. They began to study dynamic range. And the first question was, what kind of dynamic range do people expect? What, do, what are they comfortable with? And we found that that depends on the venue where you are. So if you're in a movie theater, you'll take about, looks like about 60 dB of dynamic range. So the blue is the noise. You know, you might have someone chewing popcorn or unwrapping cellophane, but the noise is low. Then the green is all that average level. And in the movies, we have about 24 dB of peak headroom, which allows the gunshot to sound like a gunshot and not like a finger snap. So home theater, people, they'll take less dynamic range because you're in a home theater, maybe the kids are playing Nintendo in the back and you're not playing it quite as loud. In the living room, people will take even less dynamic range because maybe someone's cooking in the kitchen or someone's talking, so there's more noise, so forth, kitchen and so forth car even less. In-flight entertainment, well, because the noise of the jet is so loud, we're talking about, we can only accept about 12 dB of dynamic range. Now here's a question for all of you. In terms of dynamic range, where on this chart is the average pop record today? Any guesses? Is it iPod? Is it bedroom? It's certainly not cinema. Is it car? The answer is, the average pop record today falls to the right of in-flight entertainment. So this is where we're at, and this is the problem that we need to solve, because there's no need to do that any longer and still be loud. We can be loud without doing that. So we're coming out of a, the world of peak normalization. So as we went into digital, everything was put up to zero. Everything to zero. That was the conventional wisdom. Raise it up so everything peaks at zero. That's the best we can do. 
Well, the issue with that is that different kinds of music have different amounts of peak. So if we want to watch a movie, we need much more peak to allow for whispers and screams and gunshots and crickets and everything, explosions. But when it comes to super loud rock and roll, well, we can compress it and have less peak. But the end result is all of these programs have different loudnesses. So the rock and roll track is 24 dB louder than the movie. And this is an issue especially for streaming. Because with streaming, at a touch of a button, we can hear any track from any era. So if we're playing, let's say, a Fats Waller track from 1930, and it's nice and quiet, it's uncompressed, then accidentally we switch to Anderson Park, for example, and we were listening to that Fats Waller loud, and this comes in at 24 dB hotter, you can really blow your eardrum. So it's not just a matter of listener experience, but safety. So streaming had to solve this problem. They had to make tracks play at constant level to avoid injuring people, and so people didn't have to constantly crank the knob. So this led to this new uh, idea of loudness normalization, which you'll see here. And basically the trick is we lower everything down. So we lower everything down so that the different greens all become the same. So the way this is done is we choose a target, such as minus 24, which is where television is today, and we bring down the rock track by 24 dB. We could leave the movie the way it is, and the end result is whatever station we're watching, whether it's the movie or the, or the news broadcast or the radio station or the talk station or the rock station, things are fairly consistent. All right? So just to show this another way, this is what peak normalization looks like. Imagine each of these tools as a different kind of music. So let's say this big buzzsaw blade is a symphony. It's got a lot of dynamic range. Let's say this little axe head here, or whatever it is, is a heavy metal track. Very little dynamic range. So in the old world, these are all peak normalized. Now, the end result is the loudnesses are different because we can think of the loudness as the center of gravity. So the symphony becomes much lower and the heavy metal track becomes much louder, and the loudnesses are all over the map. What we've been doing to solve this up to now is compressing the daylights out of everything. So if we compress the heck out of everything, we do solve the problem of things being roughly the same level, but look what happened to the symphony. It's become a pitiful shadow of its former self. So this isn't the answer either. So what is the answer? This loudness normalization world, where we bring everything down, and everything can then be its full, loud and proud self. So that's in a nutshell of why we had to do this. We now have tools to allow this and technology to allow this. The first thing that we now have that's new is a way to measure loudness. We never before had an agreed upon way of measuring the loudness of a track. We could measure its level, but that is very different from its loudness. So now we have loudness units. You've all probably heard of them. We have loud, loudness units full scale and so forth. And we have actual regulations governing that. Uh, EBU 128 in uh, Europe and American Television Standard A85 in the US. So we are there. Loudness normalization is a fact of life. And we have new tools such as meters that read these loudness units. And we have new targets. What is happening now is that each of these streaming services are basically networks that ingest your music. Now, we like to say I'm, my, my track is going to drop on Friday. That sounds like cool. My, my record's going to drop on Friday. Well, what's really happening is your record is getting ingested. I know it doesn't sound as dramatic or as fun, but it's like the Borg. These streaming services are pulling all this uh, stuff in, and when the track comes in, it's scanned for a loudness value. And that value stays with that track. It cannot be changed. It's a regulated measurement. And then the streaming service, based on its target, will raise or lower your track to meet that target. And there's not a damn thing we can do about it. That is it, folks. Rick Rubin cannot call Spotify and say, hey, dudes, I don't want minus 14 to be my, my, my track level. I want it to be minus 6. Sorry, it's just not going to work that way. So this is the world we have to deal with. Now, there are a variety of targets, so Spotify is at minus 14, YouTube minus 13, Apple Music minus 16, and so forth. 
So how do we deal with all this stuff and make sure that our records are playing the way we want them to play? Well, here's the issue. So we've always relied upon level. Level has been the, the hammer to get stuff loud. But in the new world of streaming, we no longer control the level. That level is taken out of our hands. The streaming service controls it. So how do we do optimal loudness now? Well, there's good news. And the, the main part of the good news is that level is really not loudness. It is not the same thing at all. And that's our way out of this, to understand what true loudness is and how to achieve it. So level is basically an objective measurement of a single variable, SPL, watts, volts, RMS. It's a really simple thing. It's the way a telephone picks it up or a microphone. Our ears do not work that way. Our ears are perceptual. So for a human being, loudness is perceptual. It's subjective. It's the result of pitch, balance, tonality, transient response, and dynamic range. And these are the values we now have to look at instead of just raw level. Now, level and loudness are related, clearly, because the more level, the more loudness. But tracks with identical levels can have very different loudnesses, and that's where we come in, to make our tracks truly loud by focusing on the attributes that, that truly work. So let's go to some audio now, and I'll get back to the theory. So that was the history of where we're at. Before getting to the examples, or as part of the first example, I want to introduce you to something we in mastering call the null test. The null test, if you don't know, is a way of seeing what the difference is between two audio files and actually hearing the difference. So if I have a track such as this track here, a reggae track. It's a propaganda war. Tell us lies like years okay, so there's our track. If I then copy that track, that file to another track, and I invert the polarity of one of them, basically you're doing a digital subtraction. We are subtracting one track from the other, and if I hit play, what should we hear? Nothing. So we're playing, we got nothing. And if we mute one, we get our audio back. And this is a very sensitive test. So for example, if I draw, lo, drop the clip gain of this track by even as much as a couple tenths of a dB, or a little bit more. So even dropping it by a tenth of a dB, we're already getting a difference. So we're able to hear the difference in these two files. Okay. So what I've set up here are three limiters. Why? Because the limiter is our main tool for getting this loudness. We all know that mastering puts on limiters. We're all looking for what's the best limiter for EDM or hip hop. So the limiter is our essential tool for getting this level up there. So I've got here three limiters that are pretty decent. We've got uh, Xenon, Fab Filter, and DMG. And here I've got the original track unlimited. So that's this. It's a propaganda war. Okay, so here's the Xenon. It's a propaganda war. Sounds pretty good. Sounds like the, like the mix, yes. Um, we can take a listen to Fab Filter. It's a propaganda war. All right, sounds pretty good. Sounds like the mix. We can take a listen to uh, DMG, another good one. It's a propaganda so there's our three limiters. They're all doing a pretty good job, and I'm actually using less limiting than I would ordinarily do in a mastering. So this is actually not heavy limiting. First thing we notice is that they all sound different. Even though they're just doing gain reduction, they, they have a different sound. It's a propaganda. It's a propaganda. It's a they all sound completely different. Well, what are they actually doing? How do we find out? We'll do our null test, all right? And this is something I call the limiter's little secret. So let's null the uh, xenon against the track. And we'll hear what the limiter is actually doing under the hood. So this is going on in the audio. We're not actually 
perceiving it because it's inside, but this is what's happening. Let's take a listen to what's happening with FabFilter. Nice. So this is temporal distortion, and this is what's happening with DMG. Now that's why these limiters all sound different. There's no EQ going on, but this distortion changes the tonality of the, uh, of the original signal. But the message here is this is what we're doing to all of our music. All of it has this <coughs> stuff going on inside of it. And that's got to affect us as human beings. So that's the cost of using limiters to bring up level to the max. We're basically tainting music. Okay, so that's one of the problems. But there's a way out. So let's take a look at the attributes that make, that make true level. Here we've got three mixes. This one obviously has virtually no compression, no limiting. This one has a bit more, and this one has a lot more. As you would expect, if I play them down, we're gonna hear a very big difference in level. Don't stop to do to battle. Stop this foolish battle. Come on, swing me, boy. Swing it, brother, swing. So that's a level of about minus 17 RMS. And if we don't go to the next track, obviously it's going to be a bit hotter. There's no way this is ever going to work out now, baby. We both so now we're up around minus 9, which is actually lower than most pop tracks. And finally here. <laughs> is kind of typical of a, a really aggressive track these days. So obviously more level. But what happens if we make the level all the same? So on this next line here, I've matched the levels to minus 17 RMS on all three tracks. So the levels are now the same. Very similar to what happens on streaming. So here's the first track. Oops. Don't stop to do to battle. Stop this foolish battle. Come on, swing the boy. Swing it, brother, swing. Ready to go. And there ain't nobody gonna hold me down. Say it, listen, boy. Hurry up and send me limit. There's no way this is ever gonna work out now, baby. We both come from different worlds. What the hell just happened? The world just got turned upside down. It's like Alice in Wonderland. Quiet became loud and loud became quiet. Notice that the track that's the most compressed is now the smallest sounding and the lowest level. That's because compressors, although we think of them as making stuff louder, they don't, they make stuff smaller. They raise the average level up, but we no longer have the benefit of that raised level because the streaming service has taken that away. So what you're hearing here is exactly how these tracks would sound on Spotify, or actually Apple Music. So if we want this fusion track to be really slim and loud, we just don't do this anymore. It's not gonna work. So streaming has taken away the level control. But what has it given us in return? Headroom, right? So now, we have all this unused space that we can bring back the snares and the kick drums and so forth. It has given us back better transient response. It's given us the freedom to create mixes as dynamic as we want to without fear of we're not loud enough. Hey, it sounds great, man, can you make it louder? It's freedom from clipping just so our, our, our music is loud enough. It allows us to deliver our mixes to the listener the same as they're heard in the studio. Now, I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly. Artists are very creative. Artists have actually embraced the world of compression and limiting and used it artistically. EDM depends on it. A lot of modern hip-hop depends on it. And urban music depends on extreme compression and limiting. And that's all good. But don't force it on the, on the folk music or on the, on the, uh, 
on the uh, jazz. Now, I'm running out of time, so I won't go a little any further, but what I would suggest in terms of how you mix for this is get back into using a VU meter. The thing about a VU meter is that it's been around since 1940. It uh, is logarithmic, so it sounds like what we hear. It's a very good visual guide for loudness. You can see a tenth of a dB in it. It's kind of got a what you see is what you get value. It doesn't overread low frequencies. And I'll show you how we can use it successfully here. We now have VU meters in the box that are actually real VU meters. They actually work like a real VU. They have the proper ballistics, so they really do sound and look like what they should. We can set a calibrating value in the back. So we can set that reference, for, for example, to be minus 12, which would then match, for example, Spotify quite nicely at minus 12. And if we want to use a loud reference track as we're, as we're mixing, we're very simple. We just simply adjust that reference for a comfortable zero VU. And basically, if you set that VU meter for, I would say, a couple of dB above the target, you'll, you'll end up with a really great sounding mix that really works well. And that's about the end of my rush presentation. I hope it gives you some, some food for thought. Wonderful. Thank you, Alan. I feel an itch to talk to Marta. Marta, for those of you guys who don't know, she's a PhD candidate and instructor at NYU and an engineer in her own right who has been specializing in 3D sound, spatial audio, and doing some incredible work there. Now, first of all, let's define what is spatial audio and how do you describe that as being different from the standard stereo audio that we're all familiar with? Um, so spatial audio is allowing us to position any sound in any direction around the listener. So uh, in contrast to traditional stereo where we have our sound seen between the two speakers and behind them, with spatial audio we can actually uh, have sound in any direction and have the full sphere of sound around the listener. And depending on different audio techniques, of course, we'll have some limitations, but the full spatial audio covers full sphere. Mm. All right. And when it comes to spatial audio, do you necessarily need like a surround sound system with a whole bunch of speakers to take advantage of it, or are there ways to experience spatial audio without specialized mics or specialized playback systems? No, actually, the, the most, um, the easiest technique for special audio is binaural audio, uh, which is mostly used uh, on headphones. And actually, it takes only one plugin. Most of them are free right now to use them and uh, implement binaural audio in your mix. Gotcha. So, uh, what would be some of the applications where people would actually be using spatial audio just through a regular pair of headphones where you might position a sound instead of just left, right, above, or behind, I imagine you can do. Below, I've heard, is difficult. But the idea is you can go all the way around. Where would that be useful? Are there applications within music production, or is it more specialized to games and movies and things like that? Um, I think it can have applications in any kind of sound production. So starting with music production where we can have much more natural positioning and panning of the sound sources because uh, when you play normal stereo file on headphones, uh, usually the sound sources will be localizing between the two ears inside the head. On the other hand, with binaural audio, uh, we can have sound sources positioned outside our head the same way as we hear sound in natural environments. So actually, it's a much more natural way of rendering the sounds. So you could just have a violin player or a guitarist or a singer-songwriter doing a simple arrangement and still benefit potentially from spatial audio when you're doing that? Yes, gotcha. yes, definitely. Besides that, of course, it's very useful for VR, AR applications where we have already, users are already immersed with the visual information which is coming from all sides. And then we actually need spatial audio to be able to match the visual cues, visual content with the auditory layer. Because if we use stereo with, uh, for example, 360 videos, our brains are, it's very easy for our brains to detect that there is a mismatch, that the auditory cues doesn't really match what we see. 
Mm. So that's why it's, it's very important for, for immersion uh, in any kind of AR or VR applications. Right, right. Yeah, it's uh, interesting to think, I mean, obviously you can think of a virtual reality video game and the bad guys coming from behind you and you, you want to do that, but it sounds like there is potential to give people something resembling a surround sound mix just through regular headphones? Yes, definitely. And also we have all of um, kinds of virtual surround systems mm. where we can actually play the surround mix on headphones. And so having so you could take a 5.1 or a 7.2 on these surround system mixes and kind of render it using some algorithm automatically down to this uh, surround headphone world. Yes, and already a lot of formats, uh, websites are using it. So then when you, when you play the audio detects, you're using headphones, and instead of using speakers, it will use the virtual surround sound to reproduce the surround mix on headphones. Right. And have you seen yet any commercial music applications for this, or is it really just in the exploratory phase when it comes to music production? I think we are still on the exploratory <laughs> territory here, yeah. unfortunately, because I think this technology has a huge potential, and I would love to bring more attention of the music producers, sound engineers to that, because I think there are so many applications. The one thing which is uh, kind of limiting that binaural audio mix uh, might sound great on headphones, but sometimes it's hard to translate it uh, as well to the speakers. So for some kinds of content, it depends on the content, but for some kind of music, it might be needed to have two separate mixes, one for binaural on headphones and one for speakers. So that might be a kind of limitation, but besides that, seeing right now how many people are using headphones, that actually most of the music is listened on headphones, I think it's, it's really a very promising technology. Uh, how does it translate? Is it at all workable to translate to normal stereo systems, or what kind of changes do you, do you hear when you play it through speakers? So it usually uh, it changes the timbre, of instruments, so uh, sometimes you might need another pass of mastering or, uh, I mean, the binaural plugins because they use natural cues of our ears. And our natural cues actually have some, um, depend on the spectral changes of the signal, which we have to introduce to the music content to, to have these cues implemented in the audio signal. So that's why when you pl play through the speaker, these cues are actually applied twice, right? Because mm. we are hearing through our natural cues and then again they are already in the signal. Right, so right. that's why uh, there, there's this change between listening through the speakers and headphones. When you were first telling me about this before uh, we started recording this conversation, the thought that popped into my mind is that there's an easy way today to kind of bridge that gap. You could potentially do a regular stereo mix for speakers, and then a separate surround mix for anyone wearing headphones. And you could easily design an app, iTunes or Spotify or some custom app, could easily sense whether or not headphones are plugged in to my phone. And if it senses headphones are plugged in or we're hooked up to the Bluetooth headphones, play the binaural version of the audio file. If we unplug the headphone jack or hook it up to our, you know, uh, Bluetooth speaker, play the regular stereo version. So this would have been a big obstacle in the past, in the days of CDs. You put the CD in, your wife or mother or father or brother or whoever is annoyed by you playing music loud says, put on the headphones, I'm doing work here, and you plug them in, oh, I have to get a new CD. It could just do it automatically now. So that could be something exciting. And you could even do that with surround formats. You could release an album that has three formats. I think that wouldn't be very difficult technology to implement for it to sense what kind of playback system we're on and then play the right kind of file. So we actually already have this technology is just not yet very popular. Uh, so the codec and format which allows that is called MPEG-H and actually this codec allows to encode uh, many different kinds of spatial audio formats and traditional formats. Uh, so with MPEG-H we can encode uh, sound objects, we can encode stereo, surround, uh, up to 22.1 or whatever, how many subwoofers we want to use, uh, mixes. Uh, and then uh, the decoder basically takes as an input our speaker setup 
or it sees that we have uh, headphones and it will automatically decode to the setup we have in our room or will decode binaurally for headphones. Great. Last quick question is state of the art on speaker surround. I mean, a lot of you are probably familiar with the idea of 5.1 surround sound, right? That is a center speaker, a left and right speaker, two rears and a subwoofer. That'd be 5.1. So if you ever hear of 7.1, we're adding on essentially additional rear fills. If we're adding on 10.2, uh, then there's two subs and, you know, even more surround fills, basically. Those have never really caught on with consumers. And I don't know if they're any longer the state of the art in commercial kind of venues and stuff. Where has speaker technology gone for surround and where do you think it's going next? So I think right now the state of the art is uh, object audio for speaker system. For example, Dolby Atmos. And the advantage of that system is that instead of mixing for concrete speakers, like we do, if, for example, mixes for 5.1, Right now we can mix uh, thinking about audio objects. So we are creating a position, we are positioning uh, sound in the space. And then when the, the sound scene is rendered, the signals are calculated um, between the speakers. So instead of determining, okay, my sound will go from, we are panning between left and right speaker, right now I'm just determining the trajectory of the sound and uh, then it is uh, calculated uh, to concrete audio signals to the speakers depending on the number of speakers available. All right. And to me it seems like one of the primary benefits there would be that it's like scalable and I hope I might just be paraphrasing what you said but you could potentially do a mix for a different number of speakers and your mix is going to translate roughly with varying degrees of precision from room to room. So that is a way where you wouldn't have to do a separate 5.1 mix for people at home and a 10-2 mix for this one theater. You do one Atmos mix and potentially, I guess, there are consumer Atmos systems, uh, it would, you, there would be no separate mix needed, right, in that, in that context. Yeah, so that's exactly what happens. So we, if you're using Atmos, you can encode your mix and it can be played in the cinema or in the home theater system or on headphones because decoder again takes the information about what is the reproduction system in the space and will decode based on that. Right. I haven't seen them caught, uh, catch on any more for home systems yet, you know, even, you know, no better than 5.1. However, this is one of those things where for a long time people are like, man, why go to the movies anymore when you can have Netflix? But if you really can have a different audio experience that it physically affects you in a different way in a theater, it really gives you a reason to go back out. And I think the increasing popularity of IMAX has been a way that you know, people have, uh, or theaters have uh, competed with the, the laptop and the iPhone you know, movies and stuff. Um, one last question I have for you is the recording this way. A lot of people are, have you guys ever heard of a binaural head microphone? You ever seen one of these? A lot of people have probably seen it. It's basically a head made out of, I don't know whether it's neoprene or plastic or what it's made out of, you probably know, uh, with little omnidirectional microphones in it. But that's been around since like the 1970s. What is current and moving forward ways to record in this kind of spatial way? So I think right now the most versatile way of recording spatial audio are ambisonic microphones. So ambisonic technology allows to capture the whole sphere of sound around the listener. Uh, and it gives uh, opportunity to then render the sound layer depending on the rotation of the head. So the listener can then rotate their head and the sound scene will rotate in relation to, to his uh, head movements. And then the ambisonic field actually can be decoded also to binaural for headphones to speakers. And to do that recording, we just need ambisonic mic, which has four coincident capsules and a simple plugin, which is they are also free to decode that later to the format we want to, to have at the end. Very cool. And to my understanding, under the hood of these ambisonic microphones is something similar to doing like an MS mic technique. Is that right? Where there's kind of phase yes, cancellation. Yes, exactly. And we could call it an extension of MS mic technique. Right. We are just adding two more uh, figure of eight microphones kind of to Interesting. that. Interesting. Well, if anyone is nerdy enough to want to know more about the tech, maybe we can ask about in the Q&A. I keep on saying one last question, but this is a fun topic. If someone wanted to get into mixing 
doing the next mix, a binaural version for headphones, what are some tools that they could use to do that? So, for example, we have, uh, if we want to do a binaural static mix, so have the listener um, looking in only one direction, the easiest tool is uh, plug-in Orbit from Sennheiser, which is free, and then we can position sound anywhere very easily and use it instead of, for example, instead of traditional panning. Another tool is uh, Facebook Spatial Workstation, which is right now in all of the Pro Tools uh, versions, and that um, takes a, m a lot of different spatial audio formats, ambisonics. We can also encode mono sources into ambisonic layer, and then it's very easy to decode that for 360 videos or as an ambisonic mix or also as a normal binaural static mix. All right, wonderful. Okay, in the interest of time, because we have so much more going on at MixCon that I want you guys to be able to check out, we are going to cut short the Q&A for those of you uh, listening to the podcast, but we'll do an in-person Q&A with these guys for any of you who want to come up to the stage and ask questions. I do have to give a couple of shout-outs once more to our sponsors for, thank, uh, for helping make MixCon and this podcast possible. Isotope, thank you guys for helping sponsor this podcast. I use a couple of Isotope tools every day when I'm mastering that have AI built into them. Ozone is one of them. There's AI with that whole tonal matching thing that you guys do in, in Ozone, right? Yep. And then RX. Where am I seeing AI under the hood in RX? So there's a few places in RX. The sort of latest and greatest in the state of the art for us at Isotope. Uh, we, um, our last version of RX came out last September. It's RX7. And one of the major new features in that is a feature called Music Rebalance, which if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's a, it's a musical unmixing tool. So you can, uh, if you have a track that has uh, voice, bass, uh, drums, and then other, uh, we can un, sort of unmix that and allow you to sort of rebalance the mix. Wonderful. But uh, Dialog, Isolate, uh, D. Russell, there's a few other of the modules are based on neural networks. You will most likely be hearing this podcast. If you're hearing the video or audio version later, I am probably going to have uh, some of the D. Reverb tool on there, which was amazing. When that came out like, four or five years ago, I was like, finally, yep. that and exists. We have, we have a new version, Dialog D. Reverb, which is machine learning based as well. Nice. And I uh, also will probably be using the Voice D. Noise, which again contains background noise from voice. And that's a machine learning thing. And I do use Ozone on the master chain for this podcast too. So really, and every time I'm mastering a record, I use your, the dynamic EQ is the one thing where even if I'm using some other compressor, I, the dynamic EQ is one of those things where you can get so much more gentle and effective than like a multiband compressor. Yeah. That's not machine learning. That's just cool. Right on. <laughs> Thanks. So thank you uh, again to John. Thank you to Marta as well for speaking to us today. Marta, a big hand of applause. And one more round of applause for Mr. Alan Silverman presenting on loudness. Man, what's old is new again. Who would have known that the VU invented in the 1940s to solve this exact problem, getting a sense for how your loudness really is performing. Man, these are questions that were asked and answered decades upon decades ago, and they're just coming back. Whenever the technology changes, the art form changes and the skill set changes. So really amazing stuff. Also, a, a shout out to two other sponsors on the podcast version of this, Sound Toys and Eventide. Both of them, you can try out anything they make for free. You can also try out anything Isotope makes for free. So check them out, isotope.com, eventideaudio.com, soundtoys.com. If you haven't tried other stuff, go try it out for free. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. See you next time.